Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to see this many people here for the first um, Sagan talk after the break. So glad to see you've all made it back, hale and hearty. Um, I am going to make a few announcements tonight and then hand the honor of introducing our speaker over to um, Dr. Karen Perimsky. Um, I'm delighted to once again so see people from both campus and the broader Delaware community here um, for the Sagan Lecture Series. Um, my name's Ellen Arnold, and I am in the history department here at Ohio Wesleyan. Um, it's been a delight to be able to organize this series so far, and I wanted to call your attention to a couple of the things that are coming up next, um, including our, first, our next two speakers both of whom are actually historians. Um, I, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to a bit of my own discipline over the next few weeks. Um, October 30th, a Thursday, and so that's slightly breaking with our normal Tuesday events. Um, October 30th, Giacomo Paranello, um, an Italian historian using GIS technology alongside um, archival research, will be talking about the history of the Po River. And then on November 4th, Election Day, make sure that you all vote. Um, and after that, come to the Sagan Lecture um, when Dolly Jorgensen will be talking about the history of the at times controversial Rigs to Reefs program involving conservationists and the oil industry. Um, I also want to take a moment uh, to point out um, two events on campus run by the Ross Museum and drawing on the Sagan theme this year. They are both running from October 13th through December 18th, one of which in the same gallery where John Sabra's work was hanging until recently, the Gallery 2001 in the Beagley, in Beagley Library. And that exhibit is Waterscapes, Transforming the Landscape. It's by a local Ohio-based photographer. And the Ohio Wesleyan Gallery Management class was involved in selecting the photos for that exhibit and mounting it, so sort of seeing it from, from start to finish. The second water-related uh, exhibits that are up are over in the Alumni Gallery in Mowry Center. And that is a landscape, an exhibition of landscape photography by Dwight Hiscano, uh, who is an alum of Ohio Wesleyan, and his exhibit is called Waterways. And so both of these are open during normal building hours, and I encourage you to take the time over the next few weeks to um, stop by and look at that artistic interpretation of the Sagan theme. Uh, thank you again all for being here, and Karen. Oh, and... Please turn off all of your cell phones. <laughs> That's what I was going to say first. Um, all right. I'm Karen Poremsky. I teach in the Department of English here. And the first thing I was going to say is turn off your cell phone. Um, Sharon Day is doing work on your behalf, even if you've never met her before. Even as she works to improve her community in Minneapolis, and as she works to raise awareness about the importance of clean water, she is doing work for all of us. Sharon is the executive director of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force in Minneapolis, a group that provides community housing for people living with disabilities, maintains a teaching garden, and provides youth education in traditional life ways of Indigenous people, and supports people living with HIV and AIDS while helping to prevent the spread of these diseases. She's also the main force behind the water walks in the Midwest United States, which include the Mississippi River Water Walk in 2013, the Ohio River Water Walk in spring of 2014, and the St. Louis Water Walk last week. That's right, she and other volunteers finished walking the length of the St. Louis River just days ago, and then she drove here to be with us. During these walks, Sharon and other volunteers not only walk the length of the river, they also raise awareness and provide learning opportunities to school groups. They advocate for the water to people in power legislators and lobbyists and corporate representatives. They observe the water and its surroundings carefully, noting the health of the environment and the challenges it faces. They talk to people who live along the rivers about their challenges, their relationship with the water, and listen to stories of their memories of interacting with the water in a very different way than we do now, drinking it, swimming in it. And they pray. 
With every step, the walkers pray for the water, thanking it and paying respect to it, letting the river know that we remember it and love it, and we accept our responsibility for taking care of it. In these ways, Sharon does work for all of us, helping to take care of the world and the people in it. Please join me in thanking Sharon Day and in welcoming her to our community. Did I turn that on? I okay. just want to say um, thank you uh, to Ellen and to uh, Karen for, um, for inviting me to be here with you. I'd like to start um, with just introducing myself to you in, in my language. Buju Nindwe Maganiduk, Nagamo my Ingen in Dishnakaz, Wabasheshi and Dodem, Ojibu Kwe and Dao in Dishnijo Medeo. So what I said to you is, um, my name is Singing Wolf. I'm from the, uh, I'm an Ojibwe woman. I'm from the Martin clan and um, second degree Medewin. Medewin in English gets translated um, as the Grand Medicine Society. And um, uh, it usually requires um, a number of years of study um, before one is initiated into the Medewin. And, um, and I said to you that I am Medewanakwe, which is um, the water woman, um, which means that in our lodge, I'm one of the head women to take care of the water. And so um, I want to also begin this evening by just um, uh, remembering um, one of my heroes uh, tonight. His name was Dr. Uh, Imoto. And uh, has anybody heard of Dr. Emoto? A few. Uh, Dr. Emoto um, studied uh, water. And he took little droplets. He would go and gather the water from a spring or a river. And he would put tiny little droplets into, um, uh, what is it, those little dishes, those little glass dishes. And then, um, he wanted to show people that water has a memory and that water responds to how we, how we treat it. And so he would say to these droplets of water, water, we thank you, we love you, we respect you. And then he would say, please forgive us. And Dr. Emoto, um, I've met him um, several times, about four times, I think, since 1998. And uh, he wanted to teach um, all of the people of the world about the water. And so he continued, after he did these first little droplets and he froze them, when they froze, and when you said these kind words to them, water, we love you, they made these beautiful crystals. But if you said to that water, and you spoke to it in an angry voice, then when they froze those droplets, they, they were jagged, and some of them even looked kind of scary. And then he did other experiments where he played music to those droplets, and uh, Beethoven, and, and then again, you could see them freeze in these beautiful shapes. And so um, my sister took Dr. Emoto's words and she made them into a song um, in our language. And uh, I'm going to uh, begin with that song. And so in Ojibwe, the words are still, water, we love you, we thank you, we respect you. <laughs> Kimi kwetu we ni mi ku kizuwe ni mi ku and you can sing with me ni be kizake ku kimi kwetu we ni mi ku 
ki so he ni mi gu ni pe ki sa ke hi gu ki ni kwa chu he ni mi gu ki so he ni mi gu this last time ni pe ki sa ke hi gu Gimme quet your way, Nimi Goo. Gees away, Nimi Goo. Hey, Quetch, thank you. I'm going to uh, start with just a little. Um, on this last walk in Ohio, um, uh, a young woman named Kiwi Kernan, who is a wonderful um, filmmaker, came along with me for about four days and she uh, shot this footage. And so a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So here we go. Nagamoma Ingen and Dishnakaz, Ojibwe Kwe and Dao. My name is Singing Wolf in Ojibwe, and my English name is Sharon Day, and I'm from the Boys Fort Reservation in northern Minnesota. The basic purpose of our water walks is of a spiritual nature. So as Ojibwe women, we're responsible for the water. It's our responsibility to take care of the water, to pray for the water, to sing for the water, to gather the water, and then to lift those petitions up to the spirits and especially to the water spirits. We learned a lot about the Ohio because the Ohio is the largest tributary of the Mississippi and it is the most polluted river in the United States, the Mississippi being the second. And so as we walked the Mississippi, we realized that you know, one of the largest polluters contributing to the dead zone in the Gulf was the Ohio River. The Ohio River has uh, numerous power plants, both coal and nuclear and also fracking plants now all along it. Those plants use the water as cooling, and so then after they use the water, then it goes back into the Ohio. We began walking the Ohio River in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we'll walk all the way to Cairo, Illinois, where the Ohio empties into the Mississippi. This walk will be 981 miles. So every morning we start at exactly the place that we left off. We offer our Sema, and one woman will begin walking with the water. And when she's done with her rotation, she hands it off to the next woman. And what she says to her is, In ga izichige ni bi onje. I will do it for the water. And she replies that back, and that continues on until we stop at night. We put some more tobacco or Sema down on the ground, and then we say, and we're telling that tobacco, we'll be back. We're asking for permission to stop. So we try to keep the water moving all day because uh, we're trying to move like the river and the river doesn't stop. It just keeps flowing. When you have to go and carry that water, you have an intimate connection with the water. And today, you know, we've lost that sort of connection to it. We see it just simply as a commodity. The answer, I believe, is, is when we understand how everything is interconnected. And so it's really to teach the people who walk with us that there's a different way of being in the world. We're trying to restore those traditions and that connection to the water. I think we need to see the water as this living entity, not just something this, you know, we turn on the faucet and it's there. If we can teach our children that water is life, and to honor that water, then I think we can begin to see a change. If we don't instill these values, how will our society change? I wanted to begin with, I've um, been working on this books about the, a book about the water walk, and maybe I shouldn't even say I'm working because I haven't worked on it for a while. But um, eventually, I will get this book done about uh, the water walks. And, um, and so people who walked with us um, 
I've asked them to send me some reflections. And I want to start with um, um, a reflection as, by a woman named Kim Kramer, who lives in uh, Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia. And this is, what she, this is what she sent me. So now, I really look at the waters that I pass in my travels. Lots of streams and ponds and rivers. I look for signs of life and apologize for the waste that is dumped in and around it. I think of Lake Superior and the many hours I have spent lying on the warm rocks at its edge. I remember washing my hair and sharing the experience of being there with my children, blueberries. I think of Point Reyes where I stayed for a bit when I was 18 and then again when my daughter worked there after she graduated college. I think of the river in British Columbia where I camped next to a hot spring. I have started remembering the water loves of my life, like these and the Chapelo and the Nemangasenda rivers that I canoed on in Ontario, and the cloud of a nude woman with a very voluptuous body hanging over us for a while, and Old Woman Bay. I remember the little water puddle I laid next to for a couple of days with a tiny little salamander like cr critter. And for some reason, I kept thinking of Jimmy Durante. Does anybody know who Jimmy Durante is? <laughs> Fasting can be pretty amusing. The coast of Portugal and this waterfall just to the side of the road in Kentucky. This place that I was at, somewhere that the water was warm, but the little underground stream in one spot was cold. The turtle egg nests on the Atlantic coast of Guatemala and the rain in Nicaragua on a steamy afternoon bathing my babies, bathing my father-in-law before he died. Here's another one. I walk along the Ohio River on Highway 65 heading south. I pass coal-fired electrical plants, and within a quarter of a mile are two nuclear power generators sitting right on the river. As I walk by them, the copper vessel with the water in one hand eagle feather in the other, filled with sadness, the words to a Midei when faith song comes to me, and I sing. When I should wing in the way way on. The ground is strewn with empty cans of Bud Light, monster energy drinks, camels, baggies, and plastic bottles filled with amber-colored liquid Truckers throw out of their windows, too rushed to stop to take a leak. All this strewn along the road by my fellow humans, used and discarded. This is how we treat Ni Mama Ki, our mother. And this is sadly how we treat each other. When we started off from uh, Pittsburgh, um, it was interesting because I had never seen, I had never seen so many um, coal-fired coal plants um, in such a dense, in just such a short period of time. And uh, many of the towns we walked through um, in uh, Ohio and um, West Virginia are sort of half deserted. And people tell me that, you know, this town, you know, Wheeling, used to be 100,000 people, and now it's 50. Parkersburg used to be 100,000 people, and now it's 50. And um, I seen, um, anyhow, this is what I wrote. It's time to change, time to move on, boom or bust, a roller coaster ride, coal, oil, nuclear power fracking, choose your poison. We walk through half-deserted towns, aging infrastructures, rusted steel sitting like dinosaur relics, poverty, and like addicts, people hunger for the glory years, still knowing that in the end, after the co companies have consumed all there is, they will be left once again. I thought about that a lot, you know, because uh, people that we met, they would say, um, 
those darn, those darn mining companies. But then in the next breath, it was, but you know, my uncle down the way, he had this piece of land that was just sitting there. He had an old trailer on it. And then the hydro company came along and said, um, could we use that land? We'll give you $5,000 a month. And then they hauled away the trailer. They filled up, built, dropped three tons of rock in there so that it would hold their hydro trucks. And they did that for three months. And they said, maybe they'll come back again. And I think that's how we are in terms of sort of what's happened across our country. Um, we're sort of like that. Uh, um, we're sort of like that person. This has never happened to me. But to some people, you meet somebody, and all those little red flags go off, right? And you know like they're absolutely wrong for you. But you do it anyway. <laughs> and it's like wonderful for a little while. And then it's not so wonderful. And... Uh, but you long for that, 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 that little time where it's wonderful. And that's kind of like how addicts are, you know, like you're always looking for that, that, first, that first feeling that you had the first time you got high. You're always looking for that. And I think that's how we are with sort of um, coal, oil, natural gas. It's like we're always looking for that... Um, the sort of, there's going to be this boom, and then there's a bust, but we're still hoping in our community that that boom will come back. So what do we do? So I can only tell you what I know. And I am a Ojibwe woman from uh, northern Minnesota, and, um, and it's those teachings um, that are the basis for the work that I do. Um, not just my work with the water, uh, but my work with young people. Um, it's the, the guiding principles in my life. The Ohio is the most polluted river in the United States. Once it ran pure and clean, and at times the water level was so low, our ancestors could walk across it. I guess that would be the Lenape, Shawnee, now over 20 locks and dams control the water levels so barges can move up and down the river carrying goods, oil, and coal. Recent chemical spills at, spills at Elk River and the Dan River coal ash dump are contributing to the already besieged waterway. There can be no doubt we are damaging our fresh water faster than it can be replenished. How did we get to this point? What do we do? According to indigenous prophecies, we may be in the time of the seventh fire. Long ago, um, my people lived on the eastern seaboard. And um, there were um, grandmothers and grandfathers, seven of them, that came to us. And they said that they had silver hair. And they were so beautiful that it was hard to even look at them. But they gave us seven, seven prophecies. And one was that there will be people coming from across the ocean and they will be carrying a big, a big knife, Chamokamai. And you need to move west until you come to a place where food goes on the water. So at that time, we were called people of the three fires. And that was Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa. And they say that if you could stand on a tall mountain and look down the coast, you would see our people extended from north of the St. Lawrence Seaway all the way through the Carolinas. And so I think to myself, you know, we lived in some pretty good, pretty good land, right? Some prime uh, real estate, lots of fish. We had plenty of food, um, blueberries. Uh, corn, um, all of those things were plentiful. Why would we move west to a place that we didn't know um, based on some prophecies? 
So they gave us these prophecies, and, um, and the people did move west until we came to a place where food grows on the water, and that food is uh, manomen. We call it wild rice. The manomen means the good grain. And so we were given these seven um, prophecies, um, and they were called the, the fires, the first fire, second fire. All of the prophecies came true. Everything they said to us came true. People did come from across the ocean. They were carrying these big swords. And um, the seventh fire signifies a time when a new people emerge, a people who lift us up and move us forward or continue the disharmony and destruction. This movement to lift us up is created only if there is peace and harmony between the indigenous people of this land and all the people who currently inhabit North America. There can be no doubt that we are at a crossroads. Do you agree with me? Climate change perhaps may be the biggest issue of our lifetime. If one were to view the Earth the way the astronauts have, one would see how fragile our atmosphere is. So, you know, I've seen these pictures from space, and the Earth uh, just looks like this big blue marble, right? And it has this little rim around it of atmosphere. It's so, it's so small. We must repair the holes in the ozone layer and diminish the damage we are doing to our planet Earth, ni mama ki. We must stop poisoning the very water that we need to live. All the water on the earth, that all the water that we have on the earth now is all the water that we're ever going to have. We must learn to conserve, learn to be resourceful without continuing the rape of the earth's precious fuels and minerals. You know, when we were just walking this last week on the St. Louis uh, River Water Walk um, where I was born, and you look at a map, and you see on this map Lake Superior, and then running into Lake Superior are all these rivers, all these rivers, and they look like exactly like arteries, like blue arteries. And flowing into Lake Superior, you know, one of the most the largest um, reservoirs of fresh water that we have in the world. And um, there are some uh, things happening in Minnesota right now where they're planning uh, a, a sulfide mine on the Iron Range. So, you know, we have mining too. And we have a whole culture of, of mining. And uh, when you drive up on the Iron Range, you know, all you see are signs that say, mining supports us, we support mining. But this mining that they're proposing is nothing like um, the open pit excavation that they're doing. Um, they plan on now, um, we have enough um, iron ore on the iron range to supply the steel needs of this country for the next hundred years. But they're not mining that iron ore. Why? Anybody know why we're not iron mining that ore? Guess, because it's cheaper to get it in other countries, right? So what they want to mine is um, copper, nickel, and why those, why those metals? Anybody have a cell phone on them? Anybody have a laptop? Because those, those are the metals that are in our cell phones and our laptops. Um, but the self using this, they're, what they're going to do is they're going to extract the ore, then they're going to use sulfide to separate the copper and the nickel from the ore. And, um, and sulfide is poisonous. And as I said earlier, you know, my people came a long, long way uh, to live in Minnesota and near the Lake Superior and the land of 10,000 lakes. And many of those lakes have wild rice, monomen. Sulfide will destroy our rice beds and destroy us as a people. 
That is our culture. That is our sacred food. The prophecies state that when the world has been befouled and the waters turned bitter by disrespect, human beings will have two options to choose from, materialism or spirituality. If we choose spirituality, we will survive. But if we choose materialism, it will be the end for us all. This is also a time of great promise. The lighting of the eighth fire will occur only if we move towards peace and harmony. The eighth fire will be one of spiritual growth among all. It is only through peace and harmony among all people, those of us who originated here and those who have sought refuge here and are currently living on Turtle Island, that we will survive. Indigenous people are invisible in our own lands. How many of you know a Native American person? Ah, good, very good. I can ask that sometimes in a, at a university, and nobody does. We are largely invisible, and yet our people, our ways, and our traditions may be one of the best hopes for our shared survival. I invite you to know us. I invite you to come along with me on a water walk. I'm going to be back here in Ohio and um, next summer, June 22nd, to walk the uh, Cuyahoga River. I invite you to walk with me. Every step will be a prayer. It is our responsibility to take care of the water, and we will, with you or without you. I desire for it to be with you, all of you. Those whose ancestors came from across an ocean but who live here today on this beautiful land, help us save our lands for my grandchildren and for yours. If you cannot walk, I invite you to make an offering every morning for the water. To say, when you, when you take that first drink of water in the morning, water, you know what to say, right? Water, we love you. Water, we love you. Is that so hard to say? Water, we love you. I don't give up. <laughs> we thank you. We respect you. Love, gratitude, and kindness are the key to, a changing, to changing the world. In this time of the seventh fire, reconciliations must occur in order for the eighth fire to be lit. And that can only happen if you know us and learn to know how to live with generosity, kindness, and love as your guiding values. This means giving up some materialism and learning to live in a way in which the spirit is at the center of all that we do. Sometimes I ask my grandson, where does the spirit live? Where does the spirit live? And he'll say to me, right here, love is where the spirit lives, where the spirit lives for love. Racism, prejudice, sexism, and greed must become a thing of the past. They are tools that do not serve any of us. I know it's hard. It's hard for me to let go of past hurts and the pain that I encounter almost every day. I'm a brown-skinned woman living in a land that was stolen from us. I'm a lesbian. Uh, what else? Um, it's hard sometimes for me to, like, to let go of that. But reconciliation is an ongoing process. It doesn't just happen once and it's done with. It's something that happens over and over and over again. So come along with me. I invite you to. Just going to finish up with this last little piece here, and then we can have some questions. Respect the water. Honor the earth. Cherish your loved ones. Honesty, kindness, generosity. Take only what you need. Conserve, preserve, and recycle. These teachings are universal. 
They come from the spiritual realm. Today, we are the discordant notes. But even the discordant notes can bring harmony if we listen. Thank you. Um, so at the end of the day, um, after we start every morning with the, the Nibi song, saying, water, we thank you, we love you, we respect you. And then at the end of the day, after we walked 28, 30 miles, um, Karen walked with us. I don't know how many miles we walked. 30? 30 miles. So um, day when we're like uh, so tired, um, we had our closing circle, and we would sing this song, and it says, Gi bimo seyan ni bi onche mede wa bu. We walk for the water, sacred water. You know, if I were a lawyer, I might be doing something else. But I'm just a simple Ojibwe woman, and I know how to walk, and I know how to pray, and I like to sing. So this is what I know how to do. It's a simple thing. But I believe that those, those water spirits, they hear us. The last time I was with Dr. Emoto, he said, there's such a mystery about water. Why does it rise? Why does ice float? Why does water freeze from the top down? If it didn't, there would be no life. He said, I think God is in the water. Microphone, if you have a question. Okay, then we're done. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's gone.
Okay. I just want to make sure I don't talk too loud. Um, do you happen to know how long um, the water walks have been going on? Um, since about um, 2003. And um, it all began um, years ago. There was a, um, a man, his name was uh, uh, Philip Deere. He lived in Oklahoma, and he said, um, this is around 1976 or so, he said, there will come a time where oil, where water, I'm sorry, he said, there will come a time where water will be more expensive than gold. And in um, 1998, um, uh, the chief of our lodge said to, said to us, what will you do? What will you do? What would happen if all of the women of the world said no more? What would happen? And so we've been walking since then. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm not a hydrologist, nor am I a scientist, but I do know this, that um, Grandmother Josephine, uh, she walked around Lake Erie in um, probably three, four, or five, 2005 or 2006, and she told me that when she, they walked around Lake Erie, that the water was um, brown and uh, very um, putrid smelling. And uh, I have to tell you that um, I was at Lake Erie last night uh, sitting on, uh, on the rocks, break wall, I guess it's called, and um, sang a song. And, and, you know, it didn't look all that bad to me, you know? And so, um, you know, there next year, um, it's um, the year, year of water in uh, Cleveland, and um, they're doing a lot of work to, uh, to take care of the water. When we, when we walked the Mississippi River, we began at the headwaters, uh, Lake Itasca, and we gathered the water, we had a water ceremony, and we drank the Mississippi River. And it was pure and clean. And uh, we carried it downstream, and when we got to St. Louis, um, we had a ceremony up on Cahokia. And so we had water that we had, you know, in a glass jar that we gathered at the headwaters. And so we told the people there, we're going to drink this Mississippi water. And they were like, we said, no, really, this is from the headwaters. It's good. And so they kind of still smelled it, you know, but they, they seen us drinking it, so they drank it. And we continued on down. And when we got to uh, Venice and Louisiana at the end, again, there were people that lived in that area. So we're going to have a water ceremony. We're going to drink the Mississippi River. And they were even more like, oh, you know. But that, though, so the water it, at the source is pure, right? It comes up out of the ground. It's pure. And that's sort of like, um, as humans, when we're born, we're born with only gifts, with only gifts. We only know love. And so only as um, humans, because we have free will, we trade some of that love for some hatred, and we trade some generosity for selfishness. I mean, that, that's this country, right? Um, we want more and more. And, um, and so we sort of become, uh, lose some, most of our gifts for those other things. But the river doesn't do anything. You know, it's we humans that pollute her. And so we're the only ones that can unpollute her. 
and everything that we do goes downstream. So in Minnesota, the way the Mississippi is when it gets to Louisiana, in Minnesota, we're the start of that. You know, and that's what I talk with folks around there. We're, we're the beginning of that. And so we have to all do what we can. And it's little things, you know. Um, what do we put in our lawn? Uh, well, here's one thing that you all can do. I'm on this crusade about straws, plastic straws. You know, I think we should, like, just refuse to use plastic straws because where do they go? Hmm? Landfill? Have any of you seen those pictures of um, the birds on those islands in the ocean and they're dying because they've consumed these little bits of plastic? Well, I believe some of those are straws. Now, when I was a kid, now I have to say that was a long time ago, we had paper straws. Anybody remember that? Paper straws? Well, we got to have plastic. Why do we have, have to have straws anyway? You know, we got lips, right? What are they for? You know, now to hug that glass so it doesn't dribble all over us. So how many are with me? Let's not use plastic straws anymore. And then let's get rid of those plastic bottles. You know, the, we don't need them, right? We can use reusable bottles. On the water walks, we try to like um, only use um, to have our own water bottle, um, to have our own bowl, our own plate to eat with, so we reduce our waste. And my, in my organization, I'm the boss. So we use, nobody on my staff would dream of buying any, any product that had styrofoam in it, no. nor anything produced by 3M. Yeah. So um, those are things that we all can do. They're simple things, you know, but we all have some responsibility to it. And then we have responsibility to do, you know, when I walk the Mississippi River, when I walk from Gulfport, Mississippi to Ashland, Wisconsin, one of the things I learned was that it doesn't matter how hard something is. If you have a mission and the spirit is at the center of that mission, you can do anything. Because I'm 63, I'm 63, and um, if I can do it, anybody can. Thank you. Any more? Sure. Sure. Before, before we take another question, I want to shamelessly follow up on that point. And, and first, I've, I've eaten dinner, I, I've eaten twice <laughs> with, with Sharon, and she's already convinced me not to use straws. Um, but she's also right about not using disposable plastic bottles for water. And I would like to, at this point, put in a reminder that we... Thank you, Sherry. That, that we have a student-designed, BPA-free, recyclable, reusable water bottles that we have um, put together to encourage people on campus to not thoughtlessly use disposable plastic um, and to use our own water and drink fresh water out of the taps. They are... Wait. Yes. Um, Agreed. Um, and, and so these are available for donations of $5, all of which go to supportwater.org, which is a five-star global charity. To Again, these little behaviors matter. So, I guess I have one quick question before I give you the microphone. Um, I was curious because I was so delighted when you agreed to come and found out that you when we um, agreed to, when, when we approached Sharon, we did not know at that point that she would be walking the Ohio. And that was such a wonderful surprise. And I'm curious if you could kind of, now that that walk is over, what are your, ling your strongest lingering impressions of the Ohio River as opposed to some of the other rivers that you've walked? Um. I think the thing about um, 
walking the Ohio River was um, walking through Appalachia and um, listening to the stories of the people who live there. And I've never been um, any place in the United States um, where people are treated so poorly, except maybe on a reservation. But I've never been any place where people are treated so poorly, uh, who have no recourse to what's happening. And so you have, um, you know, first you had coal mining, right? They severed their mineral rights, so they don't really have anything to say. You can own a piece of land. You all know this, right? You can own a piece of land, but if they want to mine it or frack it, you know, they can just do that. And uh, you don't have anything to say about that. And uh, so first there was uh, coal, and then there was oil, and then mountaintop coal removal, and now the fracking. And any single one of those things are bad enough. But in combination, um, absolutely uh, disastrous. And so, you know, my heart really um, is with the people in Appalachia, um, as it is with the people in Louisiana, you know, who are at the, again, um, at the mouth of the river where all that pollution comes down. Um, I have a friend who works in a cancer uh, center in Memphis, and they have all the babies coming up for treatment from Louisiana and Mississippi. So, and the people seem um, fairly, like, powerless. Um, and so we have to change that. You know, we have to, we have to change that. And um, we have to, like, tell people what's happening. And so, um, but that's my, that's my takeaway is that, um, you know, we have to do more. Uh, because th those families that live in Appalachia, they have a right. West Virginia, there's a county in West Virginia that has the highest rate of cancer in the whole country. You know, with the mountaintop removal, you know, when it rains, you know, they, 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 they bulldoze the top of the mountain, goes down into the hollow, and then the rain comes and washes all the mercury, everything down. And, um, you know, we, you know, those are our people. So we have to do something about that. I never would, I never would have seen that otherwise had I not walked the Ohio River. And we also have a website. It's kneebewalk.org. And um, you can find out what we're doing. You can see where I am. You can, you can learn the songs. Uh, I was just wondering, you said you guys do the river walks. I was just wondering how close to like uh, Gallia, Ohio and uh, Racine, Ohio guys do that I I have no idea <laughs> I was just asking because yeah. I'm from southeastern Ohio and it's kind of close to Parkersburg and well it, yeah we walked uh, no that was Harpers Ferry Harpers Ferry Parkersburg Parkersburg we walked right by Parkersburg in fact um, the woman uh, where I read the reflection and that's where she lives, uh, Parkersburg. And also um, the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, I believe they're located uh, in um, Huntington. And um, they walked with us and uh, made some really great friends. Yeah, in the video, when you're walking, you're walking along major highways. Were all of the roads major highways that you walked, or did well, you get Well, that was the Ohio Byway, so that was the road closest to the river. And yes, um, that's um, when we walked the St. Louis uh, River this um, this last week. Uh, Keely Kernan came out and um, filmed it, 
And she kept saying, this is so beautiful. <laughs> this is so beautiful. And I said, well, Keely, we just walked by like eight mines. You know? <laughs> and she said, yeah, but you can't see them. You know, when we walked the, and we were in the country, and she said, when we walked the Ohio River, it was like, you know, this busy road, and, you know, all you could see was the smokestacks. And, yeah, so mines don't have smokestacks, you know, in Minnesota. They're just big holes in the ground. But, um, you know, they kind of plant trees around them so you can't see, and then trees grow up on them, and they look like a big mountain, but it's not. It's really a, a mining um, a tail, uh, tailing um, yeah, hill dump. Uh, but... Um, but yeah, it was really uh, small roads in the northern part of Minnesota. It was really beautiful. And, um, and I, I, I try to tell people, you know, like, if you, if you see some of what I saw, um, you would really think twice about uh, supporting the mining. And um, there's so many things we could be doing, like um, farmers, getting farmers to, to plant uh, some shrubbery between their you know, their, their fields and, uh, and the road. You know, that would keep the fertilizer where it's supposed to be, in the field, and not in draining into our rivers and streams. Um, and I, I don't know all the laws in Ohio, but what I tell people is, you know, the walks are just the beginning. Because it's when we get home, then we have to be really vigilant about what's happening. So when I got home from the Mississippi walk, I find out that in Minnesota, we have no water quality standards around the levels of nitrites. Anybody hear of blue baby syndrome? Nitrites will do that. Um, or triclosan. Triclosan is um, uh, something that, look, take a look at your um, toothpaste, at your, um, some of your soaps. Um, triclosan, uh, is in also in fertilizer. And so when triclosan gets into our water and then it gets into our wastewater treatment um, plants um, that purifies the water, in those wastewater treatment plants they have chlorine. Triclosan plus chlorine equals dioxins. And in Minnesota we have no standards around the levels of triclosan that can go into our water. And so, um, so these are all things that, you know, I've come to learn after I've walked. And then um, in Minnesota now, they passed a law that there can be no triclosan in any of the beauty products or cleaning supplies, but they were silent about the fertilizer, which is where most of it is. And so, you know, we always have to, um, you know, we, we need to understand these things. What's happening in our own community? What made you um, start wanting to promote the mission? I mean, like, I know it's part of your culture, but, like, what made you say, I want to spread this word out? And, like, how did, like, what were your first steps to do it? Just walk. Just walk. <laughs> and indigenous people, we're about 1% of the population. At one time, um, you know, there were about 50 million of us, and as a result of history, what happened? You know, we're about 1% of the population. We are the caretakers of this hemisphere, uh, North, Central, South America. We were the people that were here. It's our responsibility to take care of the land. We cannot do it alone. We're only 1% of the population. You know, what can we do? You know, so we can bring you along, though, right? We can bring you along. We have seven... Um, Teachings, they are love, kindness, courage, honesty, humility, to seek wisdom, and there's one more. We, those are our teachings, and it, if everybody in my community, if we follow those teachings, they don't belong to just us, right? Like, what does, it, what does it say in the Bible? You know, it says to love, right? What's that thing called, the golden rule? So um, what does it say in, in you know, um, Buddhism? You know, so 
all, all people, this is universal, you know, that we, we should be kind to each other. We should live in a harmony with not only each other, but with the earth, with the water. You know, with, in Appalachia, it's not just the rivers that's polluted. It's the ground and the air. So these are the things that we have to clean up. And we can do that. We can do that, but we have to have a major shift in the values in this country. We have to have a major shift. And um, Dr. Emoto said, it's our responsibility as adults to minimize the damage we are doing in hope that our children will grow up and do things differently. Hi, um, how do you encourage future generations to be interested in like preserving water? Talking, talking to you. Um, we have um, young people on our walks all the time. <clears throat> um, and this last walk we had uh, um, Barb Baker LaRoche, she's walked with me in every walk and her, grand, her grandchildren are there. My, gr my grandchildren, um, who are not that little, they're like 26 and 24, um, 15, 18. They, they came on every single walk, even if they've had to drive all day and all night, you know, to come and walk for two days. You know, that, to me, like, that is, that's, you know, um, it's in the walking, right? It's like actually picking up that pail and walking. It's going to the river, you know, saying to the water, we love you. It's in those everyday actions that, you know, we're, we're making that shift. Um, and so, I, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to young people. Um, I have a youth theater group I work with almost whenever I can. And um, it's these young people, you know, that I really have high hopes for, um, that, that they're going to they're gonna do things differently. We have to. The earth will survive. The earth has cleansed herself time and time again in our, in our history, in our oral history. We know that. And so, um, and it wasn't 100 years. And science, scientists say this too. It was like that. You know, there was this cleansing of the earth through floods, um, ice. And, uh, you know, we may, be, we may be ready for that again. Uh, and uh, the earth... You know, the earth will survive, can survive. Everything on the earth can survive without us, and probably better. We're the only ones, right? We, we, need, we need the plants. We need uh, protein. You know, we, but everything else just fine, dude, is fine without us. I think there was somebody over here. Hi. Um, Hi. How's it going? Just as college students, um, other than not using straws and the water bottles, do you have any other just kind of daily suggestions on how we can help heal the environment or help empower these people from areas who don't have much of a say in what goes on? Um, every, um, in most of the United States, um, there are groups that um, are responsible for the water in their area, and uh, those are watershed groups. And um, it'd be great to have a couple of young people get on this local watershed group and see what's happening, because they're the ones who monitor the water. They're the ones who make the decisions. Um, last summer, we walked around this little um, widening of the Mississippi called uh, Lake um, Pokigama. And uh, the women had walked with me before, and they asked me to come. It was a little two-day walk. So we did that. And there was an old um, mine tailings dump, because uh, Grand Rapids is on the Iron Range. And there was a big uh, shovel, and it was digging into this old tailings dump. It looks like a little mountain, trees and stuff on it. And uh, so they had never seen that before, and they didn't know what was happening. So they went and found out. It turns out like um, um, what they're doing is uh, taking these 
or nuggets out of this mine tailing and um, extracting um, the precious metals from that. And nobody knew about it. They all lived in that community. And so they said, well, we're going to go back to the county board and to the watershed group and see what's happening. So it's those local watershed groups that make the decisions and know what's happening to the water. So I suggest that's another thing that you do. And, and then, and then go, when you go home and you talk to your families, what are they doing? Um, what are they putting into the river? I just have a little follow-up for that. So there are two groups uh, locally that you can get involved with. One is the Olentangy Watershed Alliance. And they were, actually, they're doing a tree planting in November. So if you look for them on Facebook, <laughs> you can like them on Facebook. Um, uh, they recently had worked with a group from Ohio Wesleyan to clean up the little creek that goes right by campus, right? You know, you know where I'm talking about? goes into the Olentangy River. There's also um, in the city, city, Delaware, city of Delaware government has a watershed um, person that's in charge of keeping track of things for the city. So the city government is also involved in this sort of thing. So we can be involved in um, joining with them and working with them and sort of keeping an eye on what's going on. Thank you. Um, earlier you said, one of your leaders said, what if all the women um, stopped and helped the water or worked towards helping the water? In your culture, in your culture, um, do women have a special connection or responsibility to water, like more so than men? Yes, and I believe that, um, you know, most places in this country, in the world, many places in the world right now, um, do not have running water. So when I was when I was little um, on the reservation, there were three pumps, and so the first thing you did every day when you got up was take the pail, go to the pump, pump the water, and haul it home. You did that in the morning and in the evening. And so when you carry the water, you know you, you have a well, you have a relationship with that water, and so women all over the world have had that responsibility, um, and many still do, and so um, we. Um, as women, we also give life, and, um, and our, our babies live in water for nine months, and that water gets purified, that water gets changed in the womb, something like once every four hours, something like that. And so, you know, we come into the world with water. Um, a fertilized egg is 96% water. We, we are water. And um, when we lose more than 50%, when our body is no longer um, at least 50% water, you know, we're gone. So we are water. How we treat each other. You know, what, I, I, what, a reporter asked me once, why do you do this? And I said, for world peace. I said, well. Oh. We are the water. How we treat our bodies, how we treat the water, it's the same, right? If we treated our, our, the water in our body, we sing to the water in our body. You know, we tell that water we, we love it. We love ourselves. You know, we love each other. We love the water. If we would treat, we, we would be living a totally different society than we live right now. There wouldn't be such a thing as domestic violence. There wouldn't be such thing as um, rape. There wouldn't be wars. You know, we really would achieve world peace. I'm not really sure that we can follow up on that. <laughs> so I, I really would like to encourage you to thank Sharon for joining us again. <laughs> <laughs>